everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. But before we do, um, and thank you for all coming out tonight to learn more about MCE. It's super exciting to be here in Vacaville. Um, I did want to give the mic over to City Manager Bush really quickly, who's going to explain a little bit about how we got to this point, why the City of Vacaville is considering MCE um, before getting into the presentation itself. So with that, I'll give it to Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Sebastian. Appreciate it. Um, as Sebastian mentions, my name is Aaron Bush. I'm the city manager here. And on behalf of myself and the rest of the staff here and uh, several city council members who are with us tonight, I want to say thank you for coming out tonight and sharing your evening with us to get some insight about uh, the potential opportunities that MCE can bring to our community. Uh, we got here because uh, over the past few years, we've heard from residents who are expressed an interest in what MCE can bring to our community in, in terms of um, possible alternatives to, to um, renewable energy sources. And so it's something that we presented to the city council earlier this year uh, about participating in the program. And so our council received a, a quick presentation from, from MCE and uh, suggested that we go ahead and pursue um, looking what this looks like. And so because this particular program um, has a variety of different components to it, a lot of moving pieces. We wanted to make sure that we shared those with our community as best as possible. Um, this is the first of several uh, outreach efforts that we'll be conducting with MCE's help um, before we present this to the City Council for their consideration. And once that's done, then there will be additional efforts to, depending on how the Council votes on that, um, there will be additional efforts to um, work with the community um, as we go forward with that process. So. Uh, Sebastian here is going to share with you a lot of the uh, details of who MCE is, um, what they are not, what they can do, what they can't do. And um, again, we appreciate your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to talk to Sebastian and his team. Uh, we also have city staff here available um, if, if you have questions regarding uh, how the city's involved in this. Okay. So with that, thank you again on behalf of the city. And I'll now turn it over to Sebastian. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. All right, well, I did want to call out uh, a couple of our employees that we have here at MCE tonight. So I'm Sebastian Kahn. I'm our Senior Community Development Manager, also joined by our VP of Public Affairs, J.B. Ackman. Uh, in the lobby, who you all probably saw was my colleague, Dave Gardy, who's a Community Development Manager as well. We have Jenna Tenney, who's our Manager of Communications and Community Engagement, and then Pulling up in the parking lot is our customer operations expert, Jared Sherwood, and he's able to talk to you all a little bit more if you have specific billing questions and things of that sort. So we can go ahead and dive in with, with that info. Um, so I think being the spirit of a community meeting, I like to kick things off in kind of a fun way. Um, who here is familiar with renewable energy? Have you heard of it? Do you know what it is? Do I have any brave souls that are willing to give me a definition of renewable energy? No? Okay, well, I'll be that brave soul then. So the way that I think about it is just using sources from the earth that are renewable to make energy. You know, um, quite recently in our existence as human beings, we discovered that the sun, lo and behold, can actually produce energy. And it comes up every day, and that's why it's considered renewable. And we're able to harness that energy so that when you go home to your home or your business, you can flip on a light switch and have power sourced from renewable sources like the sun, like wind, things of that sort. So that's what renewable energy is. And did you all know, for those of you that raised your hands, that here in the state of California, you actually have a choice of how much renewable energy is coming into your home or business when you flip the switch? Well, it's true, and that's what we do at MCE. Uh, we're a community choice aggregation program. We're a local government agency, and we give 37 different cities across four different counties, Marin, Napa, Contra Costa, and Solano County, the ability to purchase clean, renewable energy on behalf of their residents and businesses. And I'm here to explain how that process works and who MCE is. So with that, I think we can go to the next slide. So you all saw the advertisements for this workshop and you took the time out of your evenings to come down here to City Hall and to learn about MCE. And that's a beautiful thing and I thank you for doing that so much. 
Um, you know, I, I used to get kind of scared and nervous doing these types of community workshops and, and thinking, oh, what are folks going to think of MCE? What are they going to think of me? But I think for me, if I reframe it and think about the fact that you all came out here to learn, that makes things a lot easier. And, you know, I think being publicly engaged and civically engaged is one of the most important things that you all can do. I think it shows and demonstrates that you care about the well-being of your community, your family, your friends, your peers, and the decisions that impact you as Vacaville residents. So uh, kudos to you all for coming out tonight. You know, my goal for this evening is not to convince you that MCE is the best thing in the world or that it's going to solve all your energy needs. That's not my goal. What my goal is tonight is to make sure that you all leave this room with a better understanding of who MCE is, and I'm going to give you that information in a factual, objective way so that you can make informed decisions about whether or not this is something that makes sense for your community. And if that's something that we all agree on, I think we can dive in and get into who exactly is MCE. So sound good, everyone? Awesome. Let's do it. Uh, so at the core of what we do is buy and build cleaner energy for our communities. You'll see on the left-hand side here, that's MCE's component of, of energy and how we serve customers, right? So if you've ever looked um, on your bill each month for your energy bill, you'll notice that there's a couple different things, right? One of those things is the generation component of the bill, where the energy is actually coming from. That's MCE's role. We provide energy to communities from cleaner, more renewable resources. We don't replace PG&E. They're still involved in the process. And so as you see in the middle here, the transmission and distribution, the poles and the wires that you see throughout your community, that's still PG&E. They maintain that infrastructure. What we do is provide power, put power onto the grid from renewable resources that travels over those transmission and distribution lines to serve you all in the community. And that is at an incredibly high level how electric service works. So again, we are a community choice aggregation provider or CCA. And to give some background on community choice in California, you'll see the first bullet here is that there was enabling legislation in 2002, uh, Assembly Bill 117, that made it for they made it possible for organizations like MCE to exist. This happened because in the late 90s in California, we had a deregulated energy market, and we had some some problems because of that. We had um, an energy crisis in the early 2000s, if you can remember. And so this legislation was really enabled because cities and counties across the state of California said to themselves. We don't want something like this. We don't want something like this to happen again. We want more control over where our energy is coming from. And we want our residents to have a choice of where that energy is coming from. So that is where the impetus for all of this started. As you can see in the state of California on the left hand side here, or on the right hand side, excuse me, there's a bunch of green counties. These are all counties that currently have a community choice program in place. We started in California in 2008 as the first community choice program in the state of California, and that model has grown exponentially since that time. We now have about 11 million customers throughout the state of California that are served by a CCA. That makes up about 40% of all the investor-owned utilities load. And when I say investor-owned utility, that's PG&E, that's Southern California Edison, that's San Diego Gas, the companies that have shareholders that they need to pay to be able to serve energy. So we're actually serving a large percentage as CCAs, um, all of the energy demand in California. One important thing that I want to touch on is the opt out model component of this. So you've probably seen, um, you know, your neighbors in Fairfield that recently went through the process of joining MCE, that they were automatically enrolled in MCE service. That's a function of the community choice model. So it's not unique to MCE. When a city or county votes to join a CCA, they are, their customers and residents are automatically enrolled in that program. That's not to say that folks can't opt out. They always can. Customers can always have the choice to return to PG&E service if they want to do so. The way that it works for a new community is that when we decide to enroll, if the city of Vacaville chooses to go down that path, folks would be given four notifications in total, notifying them of the switch to MCE service. 
That's something that we're regulated by the state of California to provide. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but I did want to highlight that up front from the very start of the presentation that you will be notified that this is uh, potentially happening and you will always have the opportunity to return to PG&E service if you'd like to do so. And we have full-time staff at MCE that can help facilitate that. Uh, Jared, who's here tonight, is one of those folks. So again, just want to make sure that that's clear up front. But we'll go ahead and keep moving with the presentation. So part of the reason that you saw on that last slide that there are so many CCAs throughout the state of California now is because it's a model that works. It's a model that has been proven from research institutions that are making a significant impact on the state of renewable energy and the amount of renewable energy that we have uh, available in California. So we're not, um, it's, a, it's a tested method, right? It's something that has shown to work and we've been able to, uh, you know, procure more in-state renewable energy as a result of CCAs. And the reason that we do the work that we do at MCE is because we acknowledge that climate change is one of the biggest threats facing us today. Our mission is to confront the climate crisis by eliminating fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions, producing renewable energy, and creating equitable community benefits. And our vision is to lead California to an equitable, clean, affordable, and reliable energy economy by serving as a model for community-based renewable energy, energy efficiency, and cutting-edge clean tech products and programs. So here is a map of our service area. You heard me mention a little bit earlier that we serve 37 member communities throughout the Bay Area, the larger region here. Uh, here's just a breakdown of what that looks like. In Solano County, we serve about 100,000 customers in the cities of Fairfield, Benicia, Vallejo, and the unincorporated. And what's important to note is of those communities that have already joined MZE, 87% of all residents and businesses have chosen to remain with MZE service. So that does mean that 13% have opted out and they always have the opportunity to do that. But wanted to highlight those numbers for you all just to give a sense of scale of who's staying with MCE and who's returning to PG&E service. So just a little bit of background on the governance structure of MCE. We are a not-for-profit public agency. We don't have shareholders. Uh, there's no tax dollars either that go into how we fund ourselves as an agency. This is one of the main differences with CCAs um, as opposed to an investor-owned utility like pg &E. So the way that this works is that each city or county that joins MCE has the opportunity to um, appoint an elected official to serve on our board of directors, and they are able to make decisions about rates, customer programs, and policy for the communities that they serve, right? So in Solano County, you'll see some familiar faces here. Uh, Supervisor John Vasquez has served on our board since 2019, representing the unincorporated portions of the county. Uh, and then you have Council Member Dervis Penduro with your neighbors in Fairfield, who uh, recently joined MCE last year. So just a little bit of makeup of our board to give you a sense of who helps make decisions about your energy. So. In addition to our board, here's a little bit about some of MCE's compliance obligations, who's regulating MCE, and how we're ensuring compliance. So similar to PG&E, uh, the way that we're able to provide energy is by being regulated by a number of statewide agencies. So all of the same agencies that PG&E is required to report to, so are we at MCE. So you have the California Public Utilities Commission, the Energy Commission, among others. And I did just want to give a little bit of breakdown on uh, the financials of MCE. We really strive to be as innovative and efficient as possible. We've secured two investment grade credit, credit excuse me, credit ratings. Uh, we're the first CCA in the state of California to do that. And that's important because we hold a number of short and long-term contracts to be able to procure energy for our communities. And when we go into the market to purchase those uh, those power contracts, 
one of the benefits of having these credit grade, these investment grade credit ratings is that we're able to get better rates to serve you and lower rates for our communities. So just on the pie graph here, 86% of all the money that we have at MZE goes directly back into purchasing clean power. Again, we're a public agency, we don't have shareholders, so we don't have that commitment to pay out to investors. We want to be incredibly lean. 86% of that goes back to clean power. 7% uh, goes to community reinvestments like programs that we're able to offer to our member communities, which I'll get into a little bit later. And then 7% goes to operating costs, just the, the cost of doing business and um, renting office space, hiring staff, things of that sort. So just wanted to highlight some of the clean energy leadership that we've been able to uh, to have at MCE. You know, we've been 60% renewable since 2017, and we met statewide renewable goals 13 years early. Additionally, MCE's energy is about 90% greenhouse gas free, and we're aiming to be 95% greenhouse gas free by 2023, which is great. So you're probably asking at this point, what does all of this mean for me as a consumer? And that's what we want to get into now. So if the city of Vacaville decides to move forward with MCE, you would have three different choices of where your energy is coming from. Right now, in Vacaville, you only have one choice as to where your generation is coming from, and that's pg &E. Their energy is about 49% renewable. With MCE, if the city of Vacaville decides to move forward, you would now have three choices of where your energy is coming from. We have an option called light green, which is 60% renewable. And we also have an option that's 100% renewable called deep green. So diving into those choices in a little bit more detail, I uh, do want to give you a sense of where that power is actually coming from. At MCE, our power is largely coming from renewable resources. And as of 2021, 60% of our light green profile is from renewable resources, mainly from solar and wind. And you can see some other renewables in here as well, like bioenergy and geothermal. Our deep green product is 100% renewable with 50% coming from wind and 50% coming from solar. And you'll see on the bottom here that's in that white section, these are energy sources that are not renewable. One of the main things that we use in our power procurement is large hydroelectric at 37% of that light green portfolio. It's greenhouse gas free. It's not emitting any emissions into the atmosphere, but it's not considered renewable by the California Energy Commission. So that's why I wanted to call that out. It goes on a state-by-state -state basis. Sometimes other states will consider large hydro to be renewable. In California, that's not the case. So a residential cost comparison that I wanted to highlight here. One of the things that I want to mention is that we as an agency want to be as cost competitive and stable with our rates as possible. Oftentimes, we have been lower than PG&E, but we don't always claim that to be the case. So I want to be very transparent about that up front. Um, you know, in terms of what we do, we, are, we offer a cost of service model, right? And so what that means is that we offer a number of different customer programs, and part of that is factored into how we operate as an agency. And we could cut all of those customer programs and offer a lot lower energy rate, but we don't do that because we know that there are other valuable benefits that we can provide to a community like rebates for electric vehicle charging, like rebates for energy efficiency measures, like um, things of that sort that I'll get into. But I did want to call out that we don't always claim to be cheaper than pg &E. Right now, you're saving about 1% as a light green customer on your total cost of bill, which is great. And What's important about this is the local government and local control aspect of MCE allows local elected officials to serve on our board and to make decisions about how energy is being sourced for the community, right? So these are done in public forums in a transparent way. We encourage public discourse as to what's going into our rates. Um, and that's not always the case with an investor-owned utility model. So part of the value add with the CCA model for energy 
is local transparency and local decision making, which we always factor into our rates. So what I really want to cover here is understanding MCE rates and what we cover and what we do not. We set rates for electricity generation only. So if you look back to the slide that I shared earlier about um, the infographic that had the generation, that had the delivery, that had kind of the map of how the grid works, we're only handling the generation side of the energy bill. We do not set rates for delivery, how the energy gets to you, and we don't set rates for natural gas. We know right now that natural gas is expensive. It's taking up a large component of uh, your utility bill each month, but that's not something that MCE has control over or sets rates for. So just want to be very clear about that. And we typically set our rates once a year. Our rates are released to the public with a 30-day review and comment period, really to encourage that public discourse around um, rates and rate setting. So all of this is reviewed publicly by our board of directors and approved in a voting meeting. So you may be familiar with this. This is a sample bill. Um, and this is a typical PG&E bill for a customer that receives their generation from PG&E. They're not yet an MZE customer. So as you can see, all charges um, pointing with this blue arrow there, uh, all the charges, including generation and delivery, are broken down as a single line item called current electric delivery. This changes a little bit with MCE. With MCE, things are just broken down a little bit differently. So you'll see an additional line item. It's not a new charge, but it is just breaking down the different charges in a more transparent way. You'll see on your bill that you get charged for electric generation in addition to those pg e electric delivery charges. And I want to circle back just to this slide. Before, it's all bundled together. It's just coming as one charge, generation and delivery. With MCE, it's broken down a little bit differently. So you see them, uh, you see actually what you're being billed for. So going into discount programs for our customers, you may be familiar with some of the statewide programs like CARE, the California Alternate Rates for Energy, that allow customers to receive um, about 35% off on their bill for those that are income qualified. That, in addition to Medical Baseline, which is the program that gives folks with dependent medical items like, uh, let's say, a CPAP machine, um, advanced notice of a power outage, those are all still available to you as an MCE customer. If you're on those programs already with PG&E, if you were to transfer to MCE service, you're, you don't have to re-enroll. It's already something that is available for you. And some of the discount programs that um, are at PG&E and with the state, like the arrearage management program, if you ever fall behind on your bills and you need to break things down um, you know, on a monthly basis to repay that energy debt, that's something that's available to you as an MCE customer as well. Um, and with this slide, I'm actually going to turn it over to Jared, who's our, one of our in-house solar experts here at MCE. Um, to break down what rooftop solar looks like for our customers. So, Jared. Excellent. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Jared Sherwood, customer operations uh, team here. So, yeah, we know a lot of our customers have invested in rooftop solar. So we have built a program, a net energy metering, which I will refer to as NIM, uh, a NIM program where we compensate similarly to PG&E um, customers at a retail rate for all of their exports back to the grid. So on a monthly basis, if you are overproducing your solar systems, putting uh, power onto the grid, we will provide a retail credit for you. So during the spring and summer, when uh, solar customers' systems are overproducing, that credit will go into an MCE retail balance. Um, during the winter time, when, say, your solar production is down and you're using more energy, you will actually be able to draw out of that MCE retail credit balance to cover any future charges. So that is uh, similar to PG&E's program, and we actually offer a couple extra benefits. Um, and one of those benefits is what we would consider monthly billing. So PG&E, if you're a PG&E solar customer, you're probably used to getting one large <coughs> annual true up. Uh, MCE does it a little differently in which we bill on a monthly basis. We think that helps customer avoid 
large uh, annual bills and also helps you regulate your monthly energy use. Another benefit of MCE's program is over a 12 month period, if you actually produce more energy than you use, we will compensate you at the retail rate plus two cents. Uh, currently, PG&E offers just the retail rate for any net surplus generation over 12, but MCE uh, offers a little bit more value for that overproduction, adding two cents to that rate, which currently is about the retail rate, um, which just shows you how high energy costs are currently. And, and, and to highlight the third point, again, we, we bill on a monthly basis, so we are not uh, doing an annual true up, but during those months that, again, you're overproducing, that credit will go into a balance that can then be applied to future charges uh, that might be accumulated in future months. And then finally, a lot of our customers size their system to be about 50 to 60% of their net usage. So a lot of the times you still will be consuming energy from the grid. When you're doing such, you're going to be enjoying the benefits of a higher renewable energy content in that, in that power and also enjoy a, a slightly lower rates um, currently for most of the time. So um, we know that it's a complex, uh, solar can be very complex. So we offer a program that um, we think has a couple extra benefits. I would encourage you if you have solar to find me out in the lobby and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and thank you, I'll pass it back over to Sebastian. Yeah, thanks so much, Jared. So yeah, we'll be here all evening and we'll be here in the lobby to answer specific questions. So if you have questions about solar, we're going to be around. Um, so thank you. So you heard me mention a little bit earlier about some of the community benefits of MCE. As a not-for-profit public agency, we want to make sure that we're reinvesting in our local communities with programs that make sense and are tailored for you all. So I want to get into what that looks like a little bit at MCE. So as an agency, we offer a number of different customer programs. Just to name a few, we have energy efficiency programs. Let's say you're a commercial property that wants to save 15% on your bill each month by doing low cost, um, you know, not installing new capital improvement type programs to save each month on your bill. We have programs that can help you with technical assistance for that. One of the benefits of our customer programs that is really appealing to municipalities as we are trying to meet electric vehicle charging goals is our rebate program. We've installed about 1,100 EV charging ports across our four counties in the last 10 years. Um, and the way that this works is that commercial customers and municipalities are eligible for up to a $3,500 rebate per port for EV charging. Um, so if you, if you think of an EV station, it typically has two ports on it. So that's $7,000 right there that you're eligible um, for through MCE. We also offer uh, for income qualified residents opportunities to purchase an EV with rebates available through MCE. And those are stackable with other rebates that are available throughout the state of California. So folks can end up receiving about $14,000 towards the purchase of a new or used EV. All that information is outlined on our website if you want to see the different rebates, but did just want to call that out here. Um, energy resiliency, we know that as you know, we grapple with power outages across the state, one of the things that we really want to invest in is battery storage. And so we had a pilot program at MCE that we're expecting to relaunch uh, in the future that provided backup battery solutions for critical community facilities like libraries, like public schools, like uh, critical medical facilities. And there's a couple of different examples of those throughout our service area that we've worked on, but did want to call that out, out as you know, we're thinking through what are those new trends in emerging technologies that we want to invest in. Batteries are definitely one. Um, electrification, we work directly with uh, both job seekers and contractors who are hoping to train folks for this new green economy, you know, doing energy efficiency measures, working on batteries, things of that sort. We have workforce pro programs in place that, that do that. And then one of the really meaningful things that we did in the past as well is that we were able to distribute 
about 200 portable batteries in partnership with the respective centers for independent living across our service area to distribute batteries to those that were the most vulnerable during PSPS events when there were um, outages that were lasting a long time, making sure that they had all of their medical equipment could be backed up with those portable batteries. So just a high level, this is not an exhaustive list, but just to give you kind of a flavor of what our programs look like at MCE. Um, commercial programs, you heard me talk a little bit about this, uh, the $3,500 rebate that we have for EV charging. One of the things that we're really interested in this summer with the hot summer months is an idea called demand response, right? Actually controlling in the building how you're consuming energy, when you're consuming energy, when the most cost-effective times to consume energy are. And we have a program that provides free technical assistance and coaching and actually incentivizes facilities throughout our service area to conserve power and actually pay them for that, that, that power saved during peak times of 4 to 9 p.m. Uh, strategic Energy Management is a similar program that we offer where we work on behavioral change issues with commercial facilities um, to help lower their electricity bills as well. And then we're wrapping up the presentation here, but one of the things that I wanted to call out too is some of our local renewable energy projects. Um, we are always trying to identify new renewable projects, solar, wind, geothermal in our service area that can serve our communities. And to date, there's about 22 of those projects across our service area, serving about 48 megawatts of load to our communities. The cool thing about this is that all of our projects over a megawatt in size require union labor and have prevailing wage and local hire requirements as well. So just another way that we're reinvesting in our communities. Um, these are not all of the projects that we have, you know, to be able to meet demand for all of our customers. We have energy sources throughout California and the Pacific Northwest, but they just want to call out the ones specifically in our service area here. So, in closing, I think the power of MCE is that it's a model that works. It's a model that's reinvesting in local communities and is helping reduce emissions too. Since our inception as an agency, we've, ser we've saved over 700,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. We've reinvested about $214 million in our communities through the programs that I described. And we've created 6,000 jobs through the projects that were shown on the previous screen and throughout the state building cleaner, renewable energy resources. And with that, I know it's a lot of information, but I did want to highlight the steps to join MCE if the city of Vacaville were to go down that path. So the first form is for city staff to complete two PG&E forms that basically allow MCE to analyze the electric load data of the city of Vacaville to be able to ensure that we have the resources to be able to meet that demand. Um, this is not a binding agreement. It's something that, you know, the, the city can sign and it's not a commitment to join MCE. Um, the city of Vacaville has already signed those, which is great. The next steps are before June 30th, the city council here in Vacaville would need to pass a resolution, an ordinance, and a memorandum of understanding to join MCE. So that requires formal city council action. So that's something that would need to be voted on. Um, at, that, the, at that time, the mayor would sign our Joint Powers of, uh, Authority Agreement, which basically enters the city into MCE service. We conduct a technical analysis and bring that information to our board of directors um, by the end of 2023. And from there, we actually have to submit to the state of California our implementation plan that says, how are we actually going to serve the city of Vacaville? How are we going to procure the energy resources to meet demand in this community? And then the state would have to make sure that that all looks good to them and approve it. That typically happens in the spring of the following year, so 2024. So for your purposes tonight, if Vacaville were to meet that June 30th deadline and move forward with MCE, you all would be eligible for a spring 2025 enrollment date in MCE service. So um, two years from now, you'd be able to be an MCE customer. And that's the process, and we're going to be able to answer more questions in real time if you have them, but just wanted to lay this out here. And with that, I think we can open the floor up to questions. So I know we have a couple different staff members in the room tonight. I'm not sure how we want to handle this. Um, 
you know, Jared and Jenna, if you want to come down here and take a seat, that'd be great. But we also have running mics as well and can pass them to folks. So, um, so Joanne's going to help me out here with one of these mics. Thank you. All right, so we are recording this, um, and that's why we are passing the mic around. I just have a couple of questions regarding your sources of renewable energy. So MCE's projects, these are ones that MCE deployed themselves, or are you purchasing energy from existing solar farms, wind farms? I'm just trying to get clarification about if it's a combination of you know, MCE implemented projects, also existing projects? It's, it's the latter. So we go into the market to purchase energy from developers, from renewable energy across the state and throughout the Pacific Northwest um, to be able to meet demand for I you know, as a customer. Like, yeah, I was trying to figure out because you weren't, haven't been in business that long. Right. So you have to be purchasing it elsewhere before. Okay, but in future, you will be looking at developing your own renewable energy project. That is something that we're looking at. We, we'd be the first CCA in California to do that. And I think Jenna might have some additional context. Okay. Um, so, so MCE purchases power from existing projects. And we also purchase power from projects that we have been involved in that are new. So those projects are projects that we refer to as, as our role in them as quickening. So these are projects that may not have come online at all if MCE didn't purchase the power, or they are projects that would have come online maybe in 10 or 15 years if MCE didn't purchase the power. So we work with those developers to make these projects possible. And so the snapshot that Sebastian showed of our local projects, the majority of those projects were only possible because MCE was able to buy the power. A large portion of those were through our program called our feed-in tariff program. And that program provides above market rates for that power because the cost of land in the Bay Area is so high that it makes these projects very expensive. And so we've been able to get these projects built with that 50% local hire and also prevailing wage requirements so that we're also building these projects equitably. So it's a mix of all of the things of projects that we're really heavily involved in, projects that we're saying, hey, we'll buy the power if you'll build it, and projects that are already online and we'll buy the power from there. Um, I'll also just add that because we are a public agency and not for profit, we are not eligible for any of the tax credits that are available for development of renewable energy, which is part of the reason that we don't currently own any of our resources because it is more financially feasible for the developers to own and build those resources and provide MCE with the power. But most of those contracts do also have options for us to purchase those projects over time. And we are um, actively looking to do that right now. For the question. Uh, yes, sir, back here. Um, and if we could pass the mic to this gentleman so it can be captured, that'd be great. Thank you. You, you, you said that your MCE is a, uh, it's a public entity. Um, can you explain that a little more? It's, it's, MC, it's cleanenergy.org, but uh, it's, is it a quasi-governmental agency? or what, How exactly does that work? Yeah, so we're all public employees at MCE. It is, it is a government agency in that regard. Um, and I think well, probably the slide that makes the most sense is to cycle back to our board of directors. So... Again, all of our policy decisions that impact customers and the rates are decided upon in public forums by our local board of, of directors, right? So um, we, are, we are a public agency, a, a quasi-government agency, as you put it. Um, I'll just add that our official structure is a joint powers authority, um, which is how most waste and water districts in California operate as well. I don't know, John Thomas, retired Sergeant Major of Special Forces. I have a couple of questions because to me, a lot of this makes zero sense. 
and I'll tell you why. Clean power. I understand clean power, and we hear that a lot. But with clean power, these solar panels go into ground. They only have a 20-year, 30-year shelf life. So a lot of these panels that we had are now going to land, run out of space. I believe in EVs are great. However, we've just discovered these EVs don't work when it's too hot or too cold. And it does devastating damage to the environment. One, traveling around the world, I see what these mines do to the environment. And lithium and all these things, because it's a rare earth element, that's what they're using for these batteries, and they only have a certain limit. And then where do they go? Landfill. How's that helping us? That's not green. Then, also, when you're looking at these homes, all these new homes are with gas. You say you don't help gas, but then how is that really helping us? So now we have a limited time for our batteries. We have a limited time for our solar panels. But yet, Green Deal, why aren't we doing something that we did in 1941 with Henry Ford? Hemp bioplastics. One, it is truly green. It is plant-based. And when it's done, it's grounded up, and in 120 days, it's biodegradable. When you use hemp fuel, it helps the environment. When you have hemp in the ground, it helps the ground. If you build solar panels with that, it helps. The beauty thing of these things that you're talking about, but yet we're not using since 1941, is it's plant-based. It's lighter than aluminum that we're driving with right now. Ten times stronger than steel. Now, that is green. That helps the environment, and we all can't afford that. What you're doing, we cannot afford. But yet we're coming up with another level PG&E should do that. That's their job. You're creating another layer of bureaucracy that does not handle gas. If you're saying you're helping us for electricity, it's 100% electricity or get out of the game. You're trying to duplicate and get paid, regardless how it goes, from PG&E. Again, this is just another way of where all our tax dollars are going. So that's my thing. Appreciate you sharing, John. I think you you bring up some some valid and some very fair concerns with regard to to batteries and with regard to solar. I think from my perspective, when we're looking at those issues that you raise about going into landfill, about you know recycling and what that looks like for those materials, um, these are new newer technologies. And I think with any newer technology, it's going to take time to ramp up to speed to figure out how we can recycle and reinvest and be able to, you know, do that in a sustainable way. So residential batteries have only been around for not a very long time. And so I think that there's going to be investments made to to get there and to be able to, you know, make sure that those are recycled in an appropriate way. I think the important thing for us to remember when we're thinking about renewable energy is you can only take crude oil out of the ground once. Okay, so if you're if you're refining oil for, for gas, you can't put that material back into the ground. The sun's always rising, wind is blowing, and those are renewable resources that we can take advantage of. And I think if we look at it from that perspective, it's a better alternative than using natural gas, than burning coal, because we're able to reinvest with natural resources. I think on your point that you raise about... Um, about hemp and about you know materials that could be farmed to use for energy. I think that there's investments being made in that type of technology. We're not there as a state yet to be able to fully invest in, in all of that.
Um, I'll just, I'll say that I think that your point is really valid, right? There's, there's always more that we could do. Um, when MCE started in 2010, the reason that we became a separate agency is because we had asked pg e hey, could you provide more renewable energy as a, as a separate option? And they couldn't. And so when we launched, we launched with 27% renewable service where pg e was providing 13. And you can see 13 years later, we're looking at a largely, you know, 90%, 95% carbon free, right? So it's a big change over about a decade. Um, but it's a yes and approach. There's always more that can be done. And MCE is always looking for solutions that are going to get us there faster and better, right? Because as you're, you're pointing out a lot of things, how are we going to recycle these materials and what damage are those things doing to the environment? And those are questions that we're asking as well. So how do we get there as fast as possible with what is largely available right now while knowing that we have come a really long way. But I think your point is super, super valid. So thank you for, for raising that for the group. Yeah, thank you, John. I think we're, we're gonna be here for, for questions and if you wanna have a larger conversation, we, we certainly can. Thank you, we appreciate it. Um, next question here. One sec, we're going to get you the, the mic. I have a question about the solar. Um, and I talked to pg e about other cities that have gone to MCE that have solar. So it immediately triggers a true up, which I'm going to lose my true up, all my credit, because I put providers. So if I have $800, say, money coming from, from pg e I'm not allowed to use that because I'm, you guys have bonked me out of that and now I'm with your company and my trip gone, the credits that I've produced. So I'm saying with you, you say I'm going to pay 0 0.02 over the rate. Now is that a voted on rate, 0 0.02, that these people who, I don't even can see one person that's got utility experience. Um, is Are you guys going to guarantee 0 0.02 always over the base, because um, with pg and &E, I'm locked in in a 20-year contract. I'm going to be guaranteed that. Am I going to be guaranteed that with you guys, or is it voted on once a year with those people on the board right there? And then, you know what I'm saying? And you say you have this credit. How long is that? How long do I get to bank that credit for? All very great um, questions. So to, to your first question about the two cents, that is part of our tariff. And to your point, that is voted on by our board of directors. We recently made a update to our tariff this past this year, but we had not changed that tariff um, for a couple years before that. We tried to keep that rate as stable as possible. To your, to your second point about what happens to MCE credits, it's very much similar to how you're treated now except if you have positive charges in one month, rather than that going into your annual true up bank and then paying that at one time, you'll pay that on a monthly basis. But again, if you generate, uh, generate solar and actually produce positive credits, that will go into an MCE NIM balance, which will remain there for at least 12 months and can be used in those months that you're actually um, consuming energy. And to your last point about the true up, you are correct that all customers, once they transition to a CCA, they are trued up on their PG&E charges, and that true up is actually reset. But one, um, one change we've made to our program in terms of enrolling our NIM customers is we've been doing it on a rolling basis. So we'll actually look at when your true up is currently. So say your true up was in June, rather than being enrolled with everybody else in, in the springtime, you will actually be enrolled in June in line with your true up to minimize any of those credits being being lost. And you will actually just pay your your normal annual true up what you would have owed over that 12 month cycle as, as per usual. And then you will transition to MCE. So there'll be no disruption in your true up cycle. I have one more question on the solar. Mm -hmm. So can I opt out of your service before it even begins? So Correct. It mess with me? Absolutely. Yep. You can always, you always have the option to opt out. You have the option to opt out prior to enrollment, defer enrollment. You can come back to us at any time after that, but absolutely you, you do not have to take service and, and there will be no change to your, to your annual cycles. Then I have a thing. So I'm, I'm looking at that. And if I got rid of your hydroelectric um, energy and what is the other? 
Yeah, great question. Let's cycle back to Is that, that slide. Is that coal fire? It's definitely not coal fire. I think what you're- I know you guys buy power from New Mexico San Juan coal fire power plant. I, Where do I, I, get, I don't think that's accurate. Where do I get a list of all the hydroelectric plants that you buy from? Because I know you guys gave money to Knoxon in Montana, which is four times over the amount of, well, I have it right here. Where do you have on your website where all your hydroelectric power comes from? Because honestly, when you say climate change, well, as we see in the valley, our water's going away. We already took out the Iron Gate Dam up in Northern California. The Northwest is going nuts, Klamath River. So you guys have a big amount of money, power coming from large hydro, which is, it's a it's taboo right now. So are my rates gonna go up if I go with MCE because we're getting rid of large hydroelectric due to climate change? Your rates are not gonna go up. I think what we need to consider with large hydro, first to your first part of the question about where all of our resources are available, we publish on an annual basis what's called our Operational Integrated Resource Plan that outlines all of this information. It gives a 10-year a ten look ahead of where our power is coming from, where we are That's purchasing. That's on your website, right? It's now. on our website. It's a publicly available document. Because okay. um, really, if you look at it, you're not 60%. You're really 39, according to California. You put in hydro and you put in other. So the 60 refers to these yellow portions here. So if you look solar, 31, wind, 16, bioenergy, geothermal, and small hydro, that adds up to 60%. With the large hydro portion at 37, we're transitioning away from large hydro for a lot of the reasons that you're describing, right? And in that operational integrated resources plan that's on our website, it discusses over the next 10 years how much large hydro we're going to have in our portfolio. And it goes down significantly each year. What's the 40? I'm sorry? What's the other 40? Well, the, the math is all there. So the 40 is 37. Um, the unspecified other is there's what's called system power, which we're required to purchase. Basically, when we contract with a large hydro facility, there's the area where that is coming from on the grid. There are other sources that can't be traced to a specific source. There's no coal fire? There's 100% uh, no coal fire within our portfolio. Um, Jenna or... I'm not sure if there's anything you want to add here, but I think that that covers most of it. Thank you. Yeah, in, in the back here. Yeah. Uh, does the does the city of Vacaville receive anything other than, I mean, they, they're going to consume your power. I guess it'll be on, on the, their bill will look just like mine, but uh, does the city receive any remuneration or any consideration back from uh, from your company, I don't want to say kickback. That's a loaded word, but you know, I'm just saying some kind of a uh, some consideration. Is there anything that comes back to us? No, I know what you mean. Um, no, other than the customer programs that you all would be eligible for, like that EV charging for that energy efficiency programs. There, there's not anything aside from the programs that you know the city of Vacaville would would gain from joining MCE. Thank you. Oh, I'll just also add that um, it's. As, as electricity has become cleaner, this has become less of a conversation, but our municipalities do also see climate action planning benefits because they are also subject to state guidelines for um, emissions reductions within the city. Um, so it does, it does help with that as well. There's climate action benefits for the cities. Thanks for that, Jenna. Um, any other questions from the audience here? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and repeat the question. Is is there a disconnect fee with with PG&E? So if you if you were to opt out of MCE service um, for the first 120 days, no. So let's assume that the city of Vacaville moves forward with joining MCE. In April 2025, you all would be eligible for MCE service. 60 days prior to that, you get your first notification letting you know that the city is is joining. From that time period all the way until two months post enrollment date, so we're looking at June 2025 here, there's no fee whatsoever. You call MCE up, you call Jared's team, in fact, and they can opt you out of MCE service, no fee associated with that. After that window passes, there is a one time $5 fee to return to PGE service. And I'll just add the reason that we charge that fee is because that's what PGE charges us to return the account to their service. 
Thank you for the question. Uh, a couple more here. Just a quick question in terms of the opt out. Do you have to call or is it something you can do online? Jared, do you want to take how that process works? Yeah, sure. There's um, multiple ways. You can call our call center. You can, we have an online form that you can submit. Um, and you can also email us at info at mcecleanenergy.org. So my question is, I mean, look around. What is there, 25 of us here? Or a city of what, 100,000? And the six people that sit in those chairs behind you are going to make the decision for all those people to... I mean, I don't understand how that process works. And then opting out, um, I got added on in Vallejo. I have a house in Vallejo. And I didn't catch it right away because I don't read all the fine print on my bill. But after a year, I was a couple hundred dollars down. Uh, they didn't carry over my pg e discount. I was an employee. I'm a retiree now, still get it. But I, I don't understand such a a small group of us interested people and still, you know, 98,000 out, others out there or so, you know, how is the city council going to opt to do this and, and, and welcome you guys to take over power distribution here? I just wanted to first clarify on the, the point about the pg e employee discount. We actually do, um, that, that discount is applied directly to the pg e delivery services. All MCE customers that are also pg e employees get the full pg e employee discount. Um, I'll, I'll also just add that um, the city council um, has considered this and they made the decision that they wanted to hear from members of the public, right? So this is the first meeting that we're having and they're looking to do additional outreach. Um, and so I, I don't think we want to speak on behalf of the city. So I don't know if there's someone from the city that wants to speak about this and, and their, the city's position on working with members of the public. Yes, that's our plan. Absolutely. We want to reach as many people as we can on this subject because we do recognize that it is an opt out program. And so it is very important that we reach as many people as we can. And that's the direction of the city council because they want to hear from as many as you as possible before they make that important decision. So um, we'll make sure to continue to put information about how um, you can connect with us and MCE about this program. We'll have that on our website and we'll continue to post information about when and how you can um, get connected with this subject. Again, we're taping this particular program, so we can go ahead and put that out there um, for people to see. Um, but please stay tuned, and we'll continue to put information out there before we uh, bring this back to council for their consideration. Yeah, so that's... The that's a function of the state legislation that was written. I think if it were to be an opt-in model, we typically see about a 1% or 2% rate of folks opting in with any opt-in model across, across the board, right? Um, and so to be able to meet renewable goals and invest meaningfully in renewable energy in our state, that's a part of the legislation because we want people to reap the benefits of renewable energy, right? And so that's why it's an opt-out model. Again, this is not something that's unique to MCE. This is the case for 11 million other customers throughout the state of California in counties that have enrolled in a CCA. Um, I'll also just add, I think folks um, who are watching from home or will be uh, watching this later, um, there's a little bit of a question about um, why there hasn't been more outreach about this. Um, again, this is the first of these meetings that the city council is hosting, but um, MCE, we, we're we here to share information and help inform folks so that this decision can be made, right? So at this point, we're here to support the city's efforts, but if the city were to move forward, we do have a pretty extensive outreach process that we do when it comes time for enrollment. Um, so Sebastian, do you want to provide a little more information on what that timeline looks like and sure. what we do? Yeah, happy to. So um, with any city that joins MCE, we begin working with city staff to publicize and to make the community aware of what MCE is. 
about a year in advance of folks actually enrolling, right? So if you're looking at April, we would start meeting with city staff in the summer of 24 to begin to plan out what's the specific community outreach plan, who are the community leaders, what are the community events that are taking place, what are the different media sources that we can be working with, what are the highly visible things within Vacaville that we can be showing up at. And we craft that plan together and we begin to implement that in the mm, late, late winter or early like January time um, of the enrollment year. And so just to give an example of what we did in Fairfield this time last year, because they just enrolled in MCE service, we did a total of seven workshops with community that people could drop in and learn more about MCE service, answer questions in real time, we did um, two specific ones for the business community, partnering with the respective chambers in chambers of commerce in Fairfield. Um, what else did we do? We. You want to take some of the media components of this, Jenna? Yeah. Um, we share information on social media. So we share organically, and we also encourage jur the jurisdiction to share organically. But then we do paid ads targeted to the community, letting them know, hey, MCE is coming. Here's where you can get more information. Um, we also do ads in the local papers. And we typically look for the things that are most relevant to the community. So um, that's been anything from radio ads. When we did Contra Costa, we did BART ads. We've done bus um, stops, transit ads, um, billboards. So that's why we craft that community outreach plan because we're looking, you know, where where in Vacaville are, are people actually going to see this information and hear that this change is happening. Um, and then the other big thing that we do is every customer receives four mailed notices to their home. Um, two before enrollment and two after. So that lets them know, hey, this change is coming. You can opt out. Um, it Here's the benefits. Here's what you're getting. And then it says, hey, this change has happened. You can still have, you still have choices. And then after that, we move to our sort of our more regular outreach cadence, which is less intense, but we still regularly come out to community events. Um, we're attending the Fairfield uh, Blues, Brews, and Barbecue coming up. So we, you know, we like to be out in the community letting folks, folks know um, who MCE is and that outreach is ongoing in perpetuity um, within the community. And one thing I wanted to add as well, because it's super important, is acknowledging that not everybody in our community speaks English. And so those mailers that Jenna mentioned are translated both into English and Spanish. We know in Fairfield, for example, there's, you know, looking at census data, there's 30 odd percent of folks that speak Spanish at home, right? And so we want to be able to reach those customers as a public agency, right? We're serving all customers. So if we're not reaching them in an accessible way, that's on us. And we we really take that to heart. And it's even in our mission statement at MCE to help create equitable community benefits. So that's what we do um, as well and, and partner with, um, you know, ethnic chambers of commerce as well. We've been proud members of the Solano Hispanic Chamber for four years now. Um, and always looking for new organizations to partner with both from a business standpoint and from a nonprofit NGO standpoint as well. So wanted to add that in addition to uh, some of the community outreach stuff we discussed. Yes, in the back. I just want to ask one more question. For me, it's all about the money, you know? Okay, good. This renewal, the renewables are being generated, as far as I'm concerned, they're being generated regardless of whether you buy them or somebody else buys them. So I, environmental impact of Vacaville joining in, I'm not, not convinced that that's uh, a big deal. Um, but what I'm wondering about is, I looked on your website today trying to figure out how much, how much does it cost? And, but I can see that each, each city had its own... Uh, its own contract, so it has its pays its own rate, and I'm assuming that obviously Vacaville's would be closer to Fairfield's, which is the highest one on there. It's still not bad uh, kilowatt hours, but it it seems like it's way less than I pay for PG&E just the kilowatt hour charge, and so I'm I'm not quite sure why the savings seem to be so low on your uh, uh, on your examples, and uh, also those I don't know if anybody saw the actual numbers there. Your bill's 160 dollars, I think. People would be real happy if it was only one hundred and sixty dollars. Would be my guess, but um, I just is that that it, I'm assuming it gets it gets negotiated when you do the, the agreement, and then how long do those rates stay in place? So I think there's two components to this question, neither of which 
I'm the expert on how to answer. But luckily, we have Jenna and Jared here. So Jenna, if you wouldn't mind taking like the the rate structure and kind of how the board decides on those matters. And then Jared, if you wouldn't mind talking about the different vintages as he's describing, that would be super helpful. So um, the example that we use for residential cost comparisons, which is the primary example that we talk about because for business customers, it varies so widely that it's not really a useful comparison. Um, but for residential customers is based off of um, a 500 kilowatt hour a month usage. So for someone like myself, my, my bill is a lot higher than that. Um, but we, we use that average because it is the average across our service area. Um, there are a couple of different components that go into rates. So there's the actual electricity generation, which as Sebastian, Sebastian, <laughs> Sebastian mentioned earlier, um, is the only thing that MCE controls. And so our board of directors sets those rates typically on an annual basis. We have often set rates less often than that. Um, but those rates are the same across our communities. And so that's, I'll hand it over to Jared to talk about that kind of community basis that you're talking about. But before I do that, I want to also mention um, the, the per kilowatt hour charge, right? So when you look at MCEs per kilowatt hour rates, you're looking at just the generation. When you're looking at PG&E, they offer two sort of structures for that. They offer what's called bundled. Right? So you're looking at a per kilowatt hour charge, which is generation and delivery and all of the other fees associated with that. And then they have unbundled, which is the generation, and then you can see the delivery separately. And so that's what, what you would be comparing is MCE's generation to PG&E's generation, but you really have to dig in there to find that. And then I'll pass it over to Jared. Yeah, thanks. So the, the difference between what a, a person in one community might pay versus another is what we call the power charge indifference adjustment. And it, this is a fee that is, um, MCE has no control over this fee, but this is a fee that is supposed to make customers that are bundled PG&E customers and those that have departed for a CCA indifferent to some of the, the legacy costs that PG&E has incurred over time. So uh, PG&E has signed many power purchase contracts and a lot of their customer base has departed for CCA service. To recoup some of those legacy costs, the CPUC levies a fee or controls a fee, and this is applied to all IOUs depending upon their portfolio structures. They, they levy a fee to make up for that difference of what we would consider stranded costs or the difference between what they can sell their power contracts for versus what the market power, the, the cost for market power is today. Um, again, because they have so many customers leaving, they're having to sell these contracts on the open market. And a lot of these contracts are above the current market prices. So to prevent all of those fees from remaining on just the bundled customers, unbundled customers or CCA customers have to pay this power charge indifference adjustment. Very long uh, answer to to your question, but the difference between what a community, say in Marin, they left PG&E earlier than say a customer that was in Contra Costa County. So they are levied two different PCIAs based upon when they left PG&E service, because again, um, there's a portfolio of power that PG&E has. And if you, as you leave, um, you are let, you're not responsible for say that power anymore. For it. Um, so that's kind of the difference in between the communities. It's not necessarily based upon a rate that we set or agree upon. Again, this is a, a fee that is uh, decided upon by the CPUC based upon the difference of what PG&E's legacy costs are versus current market power costs. So just to final clarification point on that, the rates that MCE sets for generation are the same across all of our communities. It's just the fee that Jared spoke about that is dependent on the community and is set by PG&E. More questions from the audience? Yeah. No, one sec, we're going to get you the mic here. I, I just wanted to piggyback on what you guys just talked about. 
PG&E has a total revenue that comes in from both generation and delivery. If you start to provide the generation portion, then they have that much less revenue to cover their delivery portion. It would seem easily uh, easy, as you, I think you were talking about, Jared, uh, to raise the fees for that because they don't have enough money coming in because of the delivery, uh, the generation portion. So it seems too easy for their rates to go up very quickly with this arrangement. So, so that's exactly what the PCIA is designed to prevent is it's to prevent the customers that do not have a CCA or, or have the ability to join a CCA from taking on that burden, that cost burden of those legacy contracts. And, and to clarify, there, um, generation costs for all IOUs, it, it's a pass-through cost. So they're not allowed to actually raise delivery rates to cover the costs for their generation services. Again, that's why a PCI fee was needed, was to bring in revenue to replace some of that that cost inference of they have a lot of power contracts, they don't have customers to sell for it, they have to go um, sell it on the open market. Current market prices are lower than what they, they sign those contracts for, so there's a large fee. That that price difference cannot be levied or, or made up per se on the, on the delivery side, so that's what that PCIA fee was designed to do, was to make up for that difference. Yeah, and if I could really quick, I, I certainly don't want to speak for PG&E, but they they make revenue through other means as well, right? The, you know, let's let's say that PG&E needs to upgrade a substation, needs to make you know capital improvements on their system, they're able to recoup that cost through their rate base as well, and have that approved by the CPUC. So we don't we don't have infrastructure that we're managing at MCE. So it's another way that MC, that PG&E is able to. Uh, generate additional revenue. Right. And one of the main ways, in fact. It's just this, um, the marriage of the two uh, that I'm concerned about, right? Yes, they make money from a lot of different things, but on those two elements, the delivery and the generation, if you take away the revenue for the generation, then they have less total revenue from those two elements to pay for their other stuff and therefore can raise the rates accordingly. So um, our director of public affairs in the back there, will let her chime in and um, hopefully get to the root of your question. Thank you. It's a really good question. And I understand your concern because you don't want to see your costs skyrocketing in some other uh, vector, right? Um, So I I get that. But I I want to um, tell you that the CPUC requires uh, PG&E, like all investor-owned utilities, to provide, as Sebastian said, a rate case that gets considered by the commissioners and voted on and approved by the commissioners. The PG&E has has no ability to unilaterally raise rates any more so than we do. We would have to go through our board of directors if we wanted to raise rates. So if they saw that they needed to increase their costs for capital investment, they would take a rate case back to their commissioners with a request uh, that would explain that capital needed to maintain their infrastructure and what those costs look like. Um, to you, the customer that would end up eventually paying those things. So you would have an opportunity as a customer to weigh in on any proposed increase that PG&E was uh, suggesting in just the same way you can weigh in on our proposed increases. PG&E is required to go through public outreach processes to their communities whenever they consider a rate increase. I'll I'll add one other component here. So Jared mentioned that generation costs are what's called pass-through costs, right? And so what that means is PG&E's business is actually broken into the two sides of electricity that Sebastian called out earlier, right? There's the generation side and there's the delivery side. And these two actually operate completely separately. So the generation side is they cannot, they are not allowed to make money on the sale of electricity itself. They make all of their money on the delivery transmission infrastructure side of things. So what that means is in addition to not being able to transfer costs between the two, right? So you're pointing out that the generation is leaving, they're making less money there. They're they're actually not able to make money there at all. They're not allowed to do that. So the PCIA that Jared mentioned makes sure that they're not losing money for those contracts that they already entered into, but 
there is no revenue to be gained there. They're not actually allowed to make money on the sale of electricity itself. Okay, thank you. Since I still have the mic, <laughs> um, you mentioned a scenario. I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Sebastian, I didn't catch the whole scenario, but at some point, some community, I guess, was 100% vested in in your in this program, and then 13% opted out. Why did they opt out? Do you have a survey for why they wind up opting out? We don't have a survey. Jared could probably answer this question with his experience in the call center. So Jared, if you want to just get some. Yeah, so th there's, a, there's a variety of reasons why customers want to opt out. One of them being they just simply want to stick with PG&E. They don't like having another third party provider on their bill. So they just want to have that one bundled rate. Another is solar customers. They, they often speak to that as well to keep it simplified on the bill. Um, they, they sometimes will opt out um, of our, our service. Um, the, the other is some customers uh, have rate or cost concerns, not to say that we've ever been, um, you know, extreme, more expensive or less expensive. It's, it's been kind of up and down. Most of the time we are more or less expensive, but um, in some instances when the, uh, the cost difference has been a little bit higher on our side, that's another reason why customers will, will sometimes opt out. Okay. All right, last question. I give it away. So on that graph where you showed um, leadership, um, that one, whoop, that one. Why has that graph plateaued or actually had a dip since that 13-year early point, since 2017? It's, it, it was a constant increase up until that point, and then it just plateaus. Well, I think it's really hard to get to 100% greenhouse gas-free energy, just given all of the different resources that are available in California, and that's why it's, it's leveled off. If we could get to 100% greenhouse gas-free, we, we would. And I think 95% is, is a great milestone. And that's kind of where we're at right now as, as a state, you know, the ability to procure that energy. And, you know, I think one of the, there was a comment made earlier about, you know, I'm not sure if, you know, this moves the needle for Vacaville in terms of climate change or climate adaptation. What I think MCE does when new communities join us, it sends a market signal to developers throughout the state that, there's there's buyers for these types of energy, you know, for wind, for solar, for geothermal, for investing in battery storage. There's a market for that, and there's willing there's folks that are willing to purchase that to provide it to community. And so, as more communities join CCAs, I think we'll see that number go up because, um, you know, there's going to be more resources that become available. So that's that's my kind of um, esoteric answer to this. But I don't know if Jenna has any like more technical reasons. Um, not necessarily more technical, but, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that when MCE launched, we launched at 27% renewable compared to PG&E's 13, right? So we, out of the gate, were more than twice the renewable content of what was the only option at the time. Um, we were the only operating CCA in California until 2014. So we were on our own for four years. Um, and then another one launched. 2015, another one launched. 2017, I think three or four launched. And we're now at 25, right? So that's kind of where you're seeing that is that the gains that are able to be made as the grid becomes cleaner are smaller and they become more expensive, right? And so that's a big part of the reason that MCE offers so many customer programs is because the clean energy is really kind of plateaued. We have that 100% renewable service option. We have a 60% option, which is less expensive, but it's 95% greenhouse gas free this year. So the carbon benefits are really there. Um, but getting that extra 5% to 100% carbon free is very expensive and it would make it so that we couldn't offer the programs that help low-income folks reduce their bills or get access to clean energy technologies that improve health impacts in their home, right? Getting gas heaters out, um, getting gas stoves out, those things contribute to childhood asthma. Um, getting fossil fuels off the road, getting clean vehicles, which can be electric vehicles or, you know, in an ideal world, hydrogen vehicles as well with green hydrogen. So 
this sort of yes and approach that I mentioned earlier is what we're looking at. How can we make the most impact with the resources that we have? And we have agreed and our board of directors has agreed that providing those programs to our customers adds more value than trying to reach that additional percentage of greenhouse gas free content. Last call for more questions. Are you good? Thank you. <laughs> I have one quick question. Sure. So I Googled you guys on the California Better Business Bureau, and it was lit up by horrible customer service. You can look it up. It's like they're fresh, that people call, they try to opt out, nobody gets a return phone call. What I'm afraid is I'm going to try and opt out before you guys start. Am I going to get some kind of confirmation I'm opt out? Because I don't want to mess up my true up bill. And I hope that your customer service, because these are fresh, there's a whole bunch on there, how bad your customer service is at returning phone calls, correcting bills, people, there's solar problems, not getting reimbursed. And then also a lady puts on here that you have no lifeline rate for the fixed income senior citizens. And I was wondering if you had that. Um, okay, so to your to your first point on the Better Business Bureau, unfortunately, that is going to be just the complaints. They don't really offer the allowance to to submit um, to compliments, but we do address all of those Better Business Bureau complaints. Make sure we follow up with the customer. And to your to your question about confirmations of opt outs, yes, we send an email confirmation um, with a confirmation number for your opt out, um, as well as an effective date for that that opt out. Um, request. Um, I will also add that it is likely that those complaints came in from the beginning of the year um, when there was a transition period uh, for MCE and uh, there was a billing error on the PG&E side. And what that meant was that customers were seeing two bills worth of charges on a single bill. And so it, it was a very large bill. Um, where essentially they hadn't gotten billed for charges the month prior, and then they got billed for two months at the same time. Um, that resulted in a very high call volume because it also happened to coincide with the first time customers were seeing the extremely high natural gas prices on their bills. So there was a lot of customer concern about these bills, and our team of six people were working through all of these emails and calls as quickly as they could. Um, and we're able to get back to the majority of customers within a couple of days, but it did, it did take a couple of days sometimes for customers to reach us. Um, so those inquiries are, are, are probably related to that recent um, issue, and we have addressed that um, with our customers and also with pg &E to ensure that that particular issue doesn't happen again. And just one final point on that, we have a great relationship with pg &E, so if there is any delay on our side, say with processing and opt-out, we can do anything to, we can we can correct that on the billing side. Well, we have, again, we have colleagues over there that um, we can get those billing issues addressed in a, in a very timely manner. Thanks everyone for your questions this evening. I know we've been going for, um, about an hour and 15 minutes now. Oh, I see some mics in the back. Yeah, JB. I just wanted to, I, I don't think that we addressed the lifeline uh, question for seniors. Um, so if we could address that before we wrap up. Sure. So I think what you're referring to is the, the medical baseline program. No? Okay. I'm not familiar with, with the lifeline rate. Jared, are you? Um, no, no, we are, we have a couple, it might be a different program that we're familiar with. We, again, we have Care Farah, Medical Baseline is the, um, and then we also know of LIHEAP, but that's kind of another separate low income program offered by the, the counties themselves. Um, but if, but if you have a, I, I'd be happy to follow up with more information um, on that Lifeline program. I think we have programs that would serve the same customers that she is um, suggesting. And so perhaps you could talk a little bit more clearly about our care fair programs and the customers who are eligible for those programs. Yeah, so all care, um, all CCA customers will receive the full care uh, FARA and medical baseline discounts and the PG&E employee discount as well. So all of the 
uh, discount programs that you are currently enrolled in with PG&E. Once transition, if transitioning to CCA service or MCE, you will receive the same uh, full discounts as as any program that you're um, enrolled in. And, and for example, if in medical baseline, I know there's a couple extra um, benefits to that that aren't related to billing. You still keep those with PG&E, say during PSPS events, they'll still have that extra step of outreach and um, so because you're still a pg and &E delivery customer, there's going to be no change in any of those program enrollments, um, full di the discounts that you receive and such. Thank you, Jared. What I was saying is we've been here at the podium for a little while now, and I think if there's no other pressing questions from the audience, we can move this to the lobby area and address any one-on-one -on -one questions that you might have. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be here and are happy to answer those. And I, I did want to just give the opportunity for City Manager Bush to say any any closing remarks as well, if if you would like to. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. So first of all, thank you to our community members for coming out and taking the time to come out and find out about this important topic. Thank you to MCE for all your um, uh, wealth of information on this particular subject. Uh, we have a ways to go on this, and um, it's our responsibility to make sure that the council has um, as much information on the subject as we can possibly give them. So um, together we'll, we'll get there. And so for those of you who are still interested in pursuing more about this, uh, please take Sebastian up on his offer to, to talk um, with them, follow up with them. Um, but then please continue to take a look at our website, and uh, I assure you that we will be putting more information out about future events such as this going forward. So uh, thank you, Sebastian, and, and thank you all for coming tonight. Yeah, thank you all. Like like I started off the presentation, I, I'm so thankful that you all are being engaged with your community and taking the time out of your evening to come, to, to come down here and learn from us and ask questions. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And we'll be here... I don't want to say we'll be here all night, but we'll be here for as long as you have questions. Thank you. Um, just to avoid a little bit of crowding in the lobby, I'm going to go ahead and stand over on the side if you'd like to come speak to me. Um, and Jared, can I ask you to stand on that side as well? So if you have solar or billing questions, um, Jared's the, the right guy for that. So thank you so much. <laughs>